Hey guys, J. Steven Roberts here. I got a very interesting question from one of my Patreon supporters, Daniel. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel. So Daniel's question was, how did a man join the Knights Templar? So Daniel, here's an answer to your question in the form of a, a podcast. So the Knights Templar, as a monastic order, they were open to pretty much anybody in Christendom. So... You know, yeah, what was the qualification for joining the Templars? Well, you had to be a Christian of, of good character, basically. You could be from the peasantry, or you could be from the nobility. Now, what social class you came from determined where you would end up in the order. So, for example, if you were from the peasant class, you would become what was called a sergeant brother. Now, these were the Templars who were used in uh, infantry, for the most part. If you were from the nobility, then you would become a knight brother. And the knight brothers were, of course, the cavalry forces of the Templars, and they were the, the Templars who had the more uh, high-level, prestigious position in the order. So if you wanted to join the Templars, really all you had to do was go to your local Templar house or a Templar fortress and, and declare your intent. And from there, what happened was that that community of brothers would attempt to establish, one, your seriousness of intent. Like, did you, do you really understand what you're, you're wanting to do? And do you really intend to do it? And give yourself entirely to it, because of course joining the Templars was a lifelong thing. You know, this wasn't like, you know, I think I'll become a Templar. And later you could say, no, nah, never mind. No, that was not how it worked. And the other thing that they wanted to figure out was, were you suitable to become a Templar? So you had to be honest with the Templars about who you were and what your past was and whether or not there was anything in your past that would preclude you from joining the Templars. In particular, your social status was very important. Were you a peasant or were you from the nobility? The, the Order of Brothers wanted you to be honest about that. And they wanted to know the truth about your social standing because that would determine uh, where you would go in the order. The rituals that were set up for new entrants to, to come into the order were designed to convey the gravity of the vows. In this way, they were something like a marriage ceremony. And of course, this is found throughout uh, monasticism in medieval Christendom. The vows taken by a monk or a nun were designed to kind of be like a marriage vow. So instead of marrying another human being, you were making this vow to God. Or, you know, to be more proper, Christ is both God and man. But you were not just marrying an, a mere mortal, but you were giving yourself over as, as uh, totally devoted to Christ. So that was the idea behind the vows. So who would actually bring you in to the order? Who did you have to talk to to get into the order? Well, you had to talk to a Templar at that particular house known as a Receptor. The Receptor could be one of two Templars. He could be the local commander, so he could be the actual commander of that house or fortress. Or he could simply be a high-ranking brother who was um, ordained or set aside as um, the receptor, who that was his given role. He was the receptor. So either way, this was going to be a very high-ranking brother in that particular community. Either the commander himself or uh, a high-ranking brother who was designated as receptor. So what would happen is, once you declared your intention to join the, the community that community of brothers would require you to go through a certain period of discernment, much like, and this is kind of like what we see in monastic orders today. If, if you look at Catholic orders of monks and nuns today, this is what happens. You know, somebody is going to join the Templars. Well, that there has to be a period of discernment, you know, to live with the community or, you know, in some fashion discern whether or not this is, this is correct for you. And this could be very varied. 
depending on uh, the particular time and place, the particular group of, of Templars we're talking about. Now, before we go on here, I'd like to point something out about the issue of social class, like why the Templars place such an emphasis on where you would go depending on your social class. Part of that was just the, the way that medieval people thought, sort of the mentality and the culture, which there was a pretty distinct divide between peasant and, and noble. And incidentally, we have to keep in mind that this distinction sort of developed over the course of the High Middle Ages and kind of solidified. Like, when we look at the early history of the Templars in the early 12th century, the truth is this distinction probably was not quite as sharp as it became later on as we get into the, the late 12th century and into the 13th century. Indeed, in the early Crusades era, there was probably more social mobility, if you know, to use a sort of an, an anachronistic term. But, um, you know, the idea of uh, somebody who was maybe initially from a lower class kind of working their way up through the winning of booty or through uh, val uh, valor in arms, becoming more almost like a knight. I think we see more of that in the 11th century, in the, the early earlier years of the 12th century, and that starts to change as uh, the sort of social conditions of the High Middle Ages kind of solidify. But, but yeah, one of the reasons that the Templars, this was important to the Templars, you know, are, were you from the peasantry or were you from the nobility? Your skills, your, your martial skills would be affected by this. The Templars had very strict ways of organizing themselves and training for their military practices, for, for their, their, their strategies and that sort of thing. But one thing they didn't really do was do a lot of basic training. So, okay, you know nothing about warfare. We're going to teach you about, you know, basic sword play or basic use of a lance. The Templars really relied a lot on what somebody's background was. Like, if you were from the knightly classes, you were going to be suited for the role of brother knight. You would already know how to uh, fight in cavalry warfare. You would already know about cavalry formations and the charge and the use of a lance, the use of a sword and shield. And if you were a peasant, a lot of peasants uh, spent time as infantry troops. And peasants had their own tr military traditions and their, their own um, skills and uh, various skill sets in, in uh, combat. You know, they, they, were, uh, they were infantry troops. They knew about uh, infantry formations and... Uh, some from the peasant classes were, were archers. So, so yeah, we have this uh, this false idea. I think that that peasants were were just uh, just farmers and nothing more. They, that's that's actually not true. Peasants could be involved in uh, in various trades, and of course, uh, they could be involved in infantry. Uh, they were used as infantry, and they had skills. It, it, there's also an, an old and well debunked idea that. Medieval military ideas were kind of simplistic and chaotic, and peasants were just, you know, guys. They handed a, a spear and a shield and said, okay, you know, follow the, the, the guys on the horse, you know, <laughs> the guys on the horses. No, that's not how it worked at all. Um, medieval military ideas were just as advanced as, as, uh, as, as any age, in fact. And the, the peasants uh, had, had martial skills and skills in formation and that sort of thing. You know, peasants who were, who were infantry fighters. So, so what was the ritual itself like in which an entrant was actually brought into the order of the Templars? Well, that particular community of Templars would be assembled in what was called the chapter meeting, which we've discussed in other podcasts. And the the commanding brother would ask the assembled brothers if they had any objections to this new postulant, and that was the term used for a new admit into the, into the uh, Templar order, or a prospective admit, if you will. So the brothers were asked this, do you have any objections to this new postulant entering? And by then, it's likely that they would have already gotten to know this, this new entrance and would have would know something about who this person was 
And if somebody had an objection, they could voice it at that point. And remember, too, the importance of the community. We talked a little bit in other podcasts about how the Templars, the particular community of brothers at that particular house, they kind of governed themselves. You know, they had a master, but the community, sort of almost in a democratic fashion, made decisions as a body, if you will. If the assembled chapter meeting of brothers had no objections to this new postulant, then three senior brothers would take this postulant aside to another room to discuss in depth the hardships of the order. Now I'm going to read a quote from the Templar rule uh, as quoted by Malcolm Barber in his book, The New Knighthood. It's on page 212. Uh, This is a uh, passage pertaining to this portion of the ritual. And if he says that he will willingly suffer all for God, and that he wishes to be a serf and slave of the house forever, all the days of his life, they should ask him if he has a woman as wife or fiancé, or if he has ever made a vow or promise to another order, or if he owes a debt to any secular man which he cannot pay, and if he is healthy in his body and has no secret illness, or if he is the serf of any man. So you can see there how the community of brothers is making a point to determine, does this individual have any outside obligations that would hinder him from being a part of the order? Because he has to give himself totally over to the order. He can't have anything tying him down somewhere in his previous life. Okay, so after this, again, the postulant was brought before the chapter meeting, and he was asked again to confirm his desire. And once again, the community of brothers was was asked if they had any objections. You'll notice a theme here. There's just a lot of uh, places where they they try to stop and make sure there's no reservations on on either side. So then, before the convened brothers, the postulant would kneel before the receptor with his hands clasped, and of course that's the the posture of a homage. So this kind of mirrored, you know, a, uh, a vassal giving homage to his Lord. The postulant was then, the postulant then would ask for admission. He would formally ask the receptor to be admitted into the order. So the receptor then had some words for the postulant. And again, Barber quote, quotes these words specifically as they are found in the Templar rule. So this is what the receptor would say. Good brother, you ask a very great thing, for of our order you see only the outer appearance. For the appearance is that you see us having fine horses and good equipment and good food and drink and fine robes. And thus it seems to you that you will be well at ease. But you do not know the harsh commandments which lie beneath. For it's a painful thing for you, who are your own master, to make yourself a serf to others. For with great difficulty will you ever do anything that you wish. For if you wish to be in the land, this side of the sea, you will be sent to the other side of the sea. Or if you wish to be in Acre, you will be sent to the lands of Tripoli or Antioch or Armenia. Or you will be sent to Apulia or Sicily or Lombardy or France or Burgundy or England or to several other lands where we have houses and possessions. And if you wish to sleep, you will be woken. And if you sometimes wish to stay awake, you will be ordered to rest in your bed. So you can see there that the attempt is being made to really emphasize to this new entrant that they really have to give up everything of their, of their uh, autonomy, their, their ability to govern themselves. They really are completely at the or under the command of the order. They have to give up their free will and totally align themselves and submit themselves to this order. Now, for a sergeant brother, it was emphasized that they would have to carry out or might be be asked to carry out base tasks like tending the oven or tending a mill or working in the kitchen or working with the camels or the pigs or something like that. Because the sergeant brothers had more base uh, stations than the knight brothers. So the emphasis 
here is on negating one's personal concerns for the good of the order and for the good of Christendom. So at this point, if the, if the entrant agreed to be faithful to all of, all of these difficult terms, the postulant would then leave the room again, and this time another private meeting would be held with the receptor. And the receptor again asked the postulant if they were serious about this and asked if there were any reasons that the, post, that the postulant should let them know about that he should not be admitted. And if, if the postulant passed that portion, then again, he would go out before the chapter meeting again and would again be publicly questioned about his commitments with emphasis placed on the seriousness of, of the commitment that uh, the postulant was about to make. And at this point, the, the prospective New Templar would now take his vows. And it was, it was emphasized to this, the postulant how serious this was because he would be swearing this time on the Gospels. So here were the vows that the postulant would take. Obedience, chastity, poverty. So the three uh, big vows of any monk. Uh, also, to defend or conquer Jerusalem and to defend and protect the lands of Christendom and never to wrongfully deprive a Christian of his property or to engage in warfare between Christians. So the Templars were committed to the crusade, the cause of fighting the enemies of Christendom. They were in principle opposed to the petty conflicts that, that rose up between Christians, like say, you know, the King of England goes to war with the King of France. The Templars would never participate in that, regardless of if one side was on the right or not. So now let's read again what the rule says happened next. And again, this, is, this quote is found in Malcolm Barber's book on page 213. And then the one who holds the, the chapter should take the mantle and should place it round his neck and fasten the laces. And the chaplain brother should say the psalm, which is said, Ecce quam bonum, and the prayer to the Holy Spirit. And each of the brothers should say the pater noster. And the one who makes him a brother should raise him up and kiss him on the mouth. And it is customary for the chaplain brother to kiss him also. Now, of course, the kiss was a traditional sign of, of loyalty and vassalage, which took place between a lord and his vassal. Um, this, was, this was symbolically done all the time in medieval ritual. And it was done in, in rituals in the church as well. So at this point... The man who had previously been a new entrant would now rise a Knight Templar. So he had made his vows. He was, for life, a member of the Order. So how old did somebody have to be to join the Templars? Well, we know that the Templars did not admit children. In some of the early Benedictine monasteries, there was a practice of, you know, a child, a boy, could, could join the community and sort of be raised in the community to be pr prepared to be a monk. But the Templars did not do this. They thought that it was too much of a distraction, sort of the rearing of children would distract them from their, their mission, and that there was too much uh, education and training that needed to happen for a child of that age before they could properly really be involved in the order. Now, one thing they would do is it was possible for a, let's say a noble family had a child or a son who expressed a desire to join the Templars someday, or the family themselves wanted that son to join the Templars. There could be sort of a pact made with a particular Templar house that this lad eventually is going to come join the order when he is of age. Barber has an example of this, actually, on page 214 of the New Knighthood. He says, in 1241, for instance, in the county of Champagne, Renaud, son of Odalina, healthy and sound and sane in the head, arriving at the years of puberty and free from the tutelage of his parents, confirmed that he wished to enter the order as his mother had promised when he was still a child. So notice that uh, he's got to be a fit young man. He can't have any kind of illness that would make it to where he couldn't fulfill the role of a Knight Templar. 
Now, there were instances where the Templars did take on the custody of a boy. And this was pretty much always in the case of some great nobleman who could not be refused by the Templars. An example of this is uh, James I of Aragon, who was placed in the care of the Knights Templar in Aragon, or in, in southern France, rather, um, while he was a child, uh, basically to be kept under the protection of the Templars. And he, he, uh, he was raised at the Templar house at Monzon, and when he was of age, he took his place as King of Aragon. But, um, but yeah, again, this was a case where this was such an important a royal child that the Templars could not refuse this. Another case is uh, Alfonso Jordan, the Count of Toulouse, who uh, went off on crusade to the Holy Land in 1148, and he left his 14-year-old son, Raymond, in the care of the Templars at Jerusalem. And the reason he did this was so that actually they could train him. So pretty much exactly for, you know, what what the order often hoped to avoid. But uh, he felt that, you know, his son would get the best military training with the Templars. And, you know, he's probably right about that. And uh, once again, the Templars just really couldn't refuse somebody like Alfonso Jordan. He was too important a person. He was the Count of Toulouse. They couldn't say no to him. So... So they took, they took on um, the custody of his son. Now, as part of their, their commitment to, to the good of Christendom, the Templars provided for the poor, especially poor pilgrims. Uh, pilgrims, as they traveled throughout Europe and got to the Holy Land, could often rely on the hospitality of the Templars. The Templars took care of such people, provided them with protection, with food, with shelter. But the Templars also were very committed to caring for their elderly and infirm brothers. So if you joined the Templars, and then as you aged, or if you got sick, the order would take very good care of you. Now, a brother knight who was a warrior who fought, uh, as he got older and became no longer fit for, for combat, he would, uh, he would hand his, his arms and armor and his war horses over to, back to the order, and then he would be giving a he would excuse me he would be given a horse with a gentle gait so like just a a, uh, a riding horse not a war horse and he would also um, be given responsibilities with the order that were more fitting for an, an older gentleman so something administrative uh, perhaps he would do oftentimes these brothers would end up back in in Europe at the houses where they would you know manage uh, finances and manage new entrants and just various administrative tasks of the order. And then, of course, once they got so old that they couldn't do anything, you know, if, if they lived that long, you know, where, where they were too infirm to have any kind of active role, well, then, of course, they would simply be taken care of at the house. In fact, there was an entire uh, wing of uh, the Templar organization that was dedicated toward providing for and taking care of uh, elderly and infirm brothers. So, all right. So I, I just think this is a fascinating issue, uh, how, how somebody joined the Templars. So thanks very much to Daniel for asking this question. And like I've said in other podcasts and videos, I do get a lot of questions uh, directed at me about various Crusades topics. Uh, the place where I really do answer questions, though, just because I can't, the volume of questions I get, it, it's too large for me to to answer all of them. The place where I really do answer questions is from my Patreon supporters, just because I feel that I owe it to them. Uh, it, you know, they, they support me financially. I owe it to them to answer their questions and, and, and I'm happy to, I, I love doing it. So, so if you have questions for me, um, you know, please do become a Patreon supporter. Uh, there's a link below. I interact with my Patreon supporters quite a bit. So that, that is a way that, that uh, if, if, you, if you've got stuff you want to ask me, uh, you can ask me that stuff there uh, uh, on on my Patreon site. You can send me a private message, or you can post a response to my, the posts I make there to to Patreon supporters. So I hope everybody's doing very well. It's it's a uh, it's a beautiful day where I am right now. Hope everyone's having a great weekend. Thanks so much for listening, and if you haven't done so already, please do subscribe to this channel. If you're looking for some good books about the Knights Templar, I cannot recommend enough. Uh, Malcolm Barber's The New Knighthood, and uh, Helen Nicholson's uh, The Knights Templar, A New History. 
these are pretty much my two main go-to sources for my various podcasts on the Templars. I use other sources as well, but these two books are kind of my Bibles of the Templars. So, and yeah, if you like the music featured in this podcast, uh, click on the link below. Uh, it's available on my CD, Scatheless. I'll talk to you all soon. Walking in the yard.